Hello. I hope everybody found this school instead of academy. This is the first time in my time with us that we were not at academy, but you folks had asked us a couple of years ago to please switch it around. And I chose Green Street just be, or chose Oak Grove just because I thought we had more parking than at Green Street. So next year we'll go to Green Street and try to keep it rotating about. So welcome to the informational session for the Brattleboro Town Schools, the elementary schools, and also the Early Head Start and Head Start programs. And if you have questions on the high school budget, that's already been passed a while ago, unfortunately, but you can talk to Lyle and she can take those concerns over to that board. Um, there were a couple announcements that needed to be made. There is child care going on. There's also child care available for free on Saturday. Thank you to Tom. Where is Tom? Oh, he left. Okay. Tom Green has um, done a lot of that coordination along with Robin. So thank you to both of them and putting that together for the first time. And one other announcement. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Jennifer Jacobs from District 1 has asked me to announce or remind people that a couple of years ago she started a Facebook page called Brattleboro Representative Town Meeting and urges folks that are interested in sharing their feelings and thoughts about things to climb up there and take a look. Thank you. And in the back we do have some snacks. Feel free to join in on that and also some information on foreign exchange students and becoming a finance committee representative, I believe that's back there. So, welcome. We're hoping that this is gonna be a fairly quick presentation for you and then we can go into the budget and you can ask all the questions you want. If you can hold your questions till the end, that'll be great. Starting out with introductions, tonight we wanted to look at the challenges our student population is facing and therefore also our staff. Um, Main reason for that is those of us sitting up here as board members also say a lot of times when we listen to these presentations, wow, I had no idea. And David and I were actually on WKVT this morning talking with Olga about it, and that's a good thing. Because if we as parents coming into the school only saw some of the challenges that our staff are dealing with, that wouldn't be a very successful school. But on the other hand, we also think it's important for people in the town to know the realities of what's going on. So we wanted to concentrate on that tonight. And then also, there's some excellent, excellent work being happening in our schools, and we wanted you all to know about that and see it. And then, of course, we'll go into the budget, and then we'll take questions. So with that, I think I turn it over to Lyle. Thank you, good evening. So, do you have the clicker? You can go to the next one. Thank you. We're going to give you a little bit of data about our families in Wyndham Southeast. We're talking today, though, about Prattleboro, so that's uh, Head Start, Early Head Start. Um, Deb Gass is the director. Um, Academy School with Andy Patchouli and Kelly Dias. Green Street School with Mark Spino. And Oak Grove School with Jerry Curry. So we'll be focusing on those tonight. Um, also in our pr presentation tonight, we'll be um, calling on Julianne Egan, Paul Smith to also talk with us about some of our um, data, and Shelley Wilson as well. So starting with EES. EES is Early Education Services, Head Start, Early Head Start. This is, as you can see up there, pregnancy to kindergarten. Here are a few points of data we want to make sure that you are aware of. Um, there are some huge changes over the last five to ten years. Um, as you can see, 14% of our families in EES are homeless. Um, we have a number in foster care. Um, the number of families incarcerated has risen to 9%. Um, however, 57% of our families are employed or working towards employment. Um, and in the elementary schools, it's very interesting. About five students in every classroom have experienced some type of trauma. And in just a few minutes, we're going to ha hear a segment on the counselors. They did a, a presentation for the board uh, last week, I believe it was, about trauma. And trauma is hugely impacting classrooms. Um, approximately 10 students in a classroom have exceptional needs. And 30% of school changes over year. That's what we call transient. That means the students that have started the year 
at a school have moved out or new students have moved in, um, that's a, a pretty startling number, thinking about the fact that there's, a 30, there's possibly a 30% turnover within a classroom in a single school year. Who's next? So some of the things, the factors affecting our student learning, uh, we have homelessness. I know just from, I looked at our reports that the administrators give us, and I reviewed February's numbers. Um, and in February, we had 20 students across our three schools, and this doesn't include EES, that, are home, that were homeless. Um, we have opioids, the opiates don't really need to get into that too much. We all know what a crisis that is, not just in our town, in our state, but in our country. Um, students living in trauma, they're all different levels of trauma. Like Lyle said, we're gonna, the, uh, the, social, work, the social worker and the, um, the counselors uh, in, our, in our next little presentation, they go into that in more depth. The transiency, Last, um, Mark was just saying at our meeting right before this, last week there were six students that just came to Green Street. Um, so it's not, they came from Vernon, they're coming from other states. Uh, so that's a big, big difference in a student and um, having the support that they need. Poverty, this is all based on, on the uh, free and reduced, the percentages um, in our February reports 57% of the students in Academy were on free and reduced, 69% from Green Street, and 52% from Oak Grove. That's a, huge pop, that's a huge percentage of students. And that leads to our food insecurity, which based on the numbers that we have, we have the universal meals, so which helps the students. We have the backpack program just to help, uh, because we all know students need food to learn. But that's where food goes home um, for the weekends for students because there are some students, the only food that they get is the meals when they, that they come to school for. Shut down. Can't touch it. 
uh, one of the students we see a different kind of acting out, or maybe it's more violence and aggression towards peers. With another one, it might be defiance, like maybe just getting up and walking out of the room without telling anyone where you're going. So these are the kind of issues that kids are dealing with. That again, I try to help them and help build some resiliency. We had a family that moved here. It's a family that has multiple children. Uh, this family has experienced homelessness. They've experienced um, drug abuse. They've experienced a parent being in jail. So the same family has also been in three schools in five years. And at a meeting that we had uh, last year, I think it was Andy had brought that up at the school board, that this is another trauma and another stressor, at least, that kids are dealing with a more transient population. So this family comes to us, and these are already the issues that these kids have dealt with, as well as witnessing domestic violence. With the social curriculum and the classroom work that I'm doing, that's primarily with the Second Step program, which is an anti-bullying and anti-violence curriculum. A lot of that is about teaching them things which can be taught. It's not something that we're born having or knowing how to use that, but being able to identify emotions in yourself and others and to take another person's perspective is a really critical skill for students. A lot of the units within the curriculum deal with impulse control and problem solving, which again is an issue that more and more as kids are facing more anxiety producing events in their life, we see a problem with impulse control. One of my main goals as a school counselor here is that every student in the school has a champion, that every student in the school has someone that they can trust and that they know that there's a door that's open and there's an adult that's willing to sit down and problem solve and listen and help them with the things they're dealing with. I would say in the last seven years, I've just seen an increase, a pretty profound increase in terms of the needs for kids. This is based on knowing children that have experienced and documented profound child abuse, neglect, tra traumatic deaths in their family, um, witness to violent crime. So to think that 35% in a classroom Brains are already altered for these young children. It's a pretty devastating impact for a school community. At Oak Grove alone, 22% of our students have IEPs. As of a meeting today, we have an additional 10 IEPs that are pending. 13% of Oak Grove students have 504s. As of today, five additional students are pending 504s. And these are 504s for kids who have PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, who have pervasive um, child development, traumatic disorder, and ADHD. 22% of our students need ESD support, which means the classroom teachers are discovering that their tier one instruction is not enough. And 11% of our students need step behavioral supports, which is significant behavior support. But what we're looking at is 57, probably more, percent of our students who need specialized instruction, specialized accommodations, or specialized interventions in the classroom. It really, I mean, this translates to one out of every two kids is in this category at our little school of 130 kids, K through six, 140 kids, um, pre-K through six. And that means for any classroom teacher, whether they're sitting with a group of 16 or a group of 20, they can have 10 kids in that classroom who are in exceptional need over and above a general tier one instruction. I love our therapy dog program. It is truly phenomenal. It is better than I ever thought it would be. We have um, Meg and Ann who come in on Thursdays and Meggie is a huge um, great peer and she is um, she just lies on the floor and the kids lie on her and you think what really how is that going to help kids well what it does is it calms their bodies and it calms their minds and when the kids are petting Meggie and when they're sitting with me in small groups of three they're able to talk about what's on their, what's in their head or what's going on at home and it's a really safe way for them to do that um, we just had Devin Seamus visit this past Monday and this past Monday we had a um, tragedy in our school and I was kind of unsure about how I was going to manage it all um, and so what happened though is this big huge Newfoundland comes in and these kids just come and they lie on this Newfoundland and they're calm. And because the tragedy impacted our whole Green Street family, teachers came and they saw Seamus and they pinned him and they felt better. The needs of our families in our community are complex and multifaceted. Families and what they need must be recognized and addressed at the school level to promote good attendance and create the best setting for social, academic, and emotional growth. Just like our community, our schools cannot ignore or avoid these needs that our families present with. If ignored, the needs and issues will erode away our students' ability to create their own resiliencies. And research does indicate resiliency can be built upon. 
It can be built up uh, through positive attitude, community, good communications. Self-efficacy is a very big promoter of resiliency. My job, my goal is to work largely to connect families to needed community-based services. Outside of the school, I work with a lot of agencies as well as the other elementary schools, but agencies such as Groundworks, Big Brothers Big Sisters, Kids and Coats, Freedom Center, Winston Proudy, Economic Services. And support can be also, I can direct families to support through mental health agencies. Um, I've been working very diligently on relationships within the families because I think that's really important to be able to have that relationship so when they do need a resource, they can ultimately come to me or if a teacher or administration or somebody within the school comes to me, I can direct that family to a support system in the community. I really appreciate having Jody here and there's just too much need for what you need. And with all the things I have to deal with during the day, I can't get out in the community and be doing these home visits, uh, the partnerships that she's developed with like economic services, DCF, all these other players, and the families have so much need that to be able to have a person who can sit down explain something, you know, help them like with housing or filling forms out has been really critical. And she's done an excellent job with forming, you know, friendships and relationships with a lot of the really important players in the community. So it's been a boon. I mean, it's been really helpful for this school and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Judith. Thanks. We have currently about 10 students um, who are either in DCF custody or in their um, sort of provisional care. And that requires a tremendous amount of organization, both on my part and Jerry's, in terms of what do these students need, where are they spending the night, um, what transition is happening, what support hearing is going on. And it is a pretty constant um, communication that we re we are the ones who have to drive it. If we were <laughs> If we weren't making the calls and we weren't doing the emails, we wouldn't know and the kids wouldn't know. The kids would be sick. DCF is over the top and so we have to be really instrumental in uh, keeping informed with what's happening for these students. Family engagement is key in helping this, healing this process. Um, it's not the only answer, but it is definitely one of the pieces of the puzzle as Jody already spoke about. The more we can engage our families and support them in managing their lives, then we see kids having better social skills, improved behavior, high test scores. The recommendation I'm getting from all the people that I'm listening and learning from is that doing family systems work has the biggest impact for children. That's how we change communication patterns at home. That's how we build positive environments for kids to feel safe and to learn. That's how we break down barriers for support. And so I think using a social worker to help do that really great, intense family work would have such a great impact for the kids who've experienced trauma at Great Street School. I will say we have remarkably joyful, resilient kids. Absolutely. But we also have children who are in tremendous need of specialized and individualized um, supports. It seems like we figured out the tier one, tier two, tier three instruction and interventions for the academic needs. Where we are really struggling at Oak Row is how do we best meet the mental health needs and the emotional behavior. So that link we'll have up on the website for us, and we can actually send it in an email to everybody here in case you couldn't hear it as well. Maybe you go home, you can put in headphones and hear it. But it was our presentation last week, and thanks again to BCTV for pulling that together. Em did all that work so that we could catch little snippets from, I think we listened for about an hour and a half, is that about right, to their presentations. And we kind of tried to bring it down to the most key things that we thought you all would want to hear about as well about what's going on in our community. Who's next up? Robin, I think you're up. Okay, 
So I'm going to talk about some uh, statistical information about the, the um, student demographics at our schools. Um, so this is a, the enrollment at each school. Academy's on the top in blue. That's our largest school. Uh, the middle row is Green Street School, and the gray one on the bottom is Oak Grove. So you can see that over the last um, uh, eight years or so, the, the populations of the two smaller schools are s slightly declining with the academy sort of uh, holding almost steady at the top. And then um, at the same time, we have an overall rise in our whole supervisory union the level of poverty in the schools. This is based on, uh, as Kim said, the number of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch, although, of course, at our town schools here in Brattleboro, everyone gets free meals, but we still use those um, statistics to qualify for programs and assess uh, student needs. So we can see the, the same colors, I think, is on the other one. Green, or Green Street is yellow on this one. Oak Grove is green. And Academy School is the lighter blue top line there. So each of those schools you can see climbing up to a higher level of um, low-income students than we had in 2009. Here's just a, the three Brattleboro Town schools. And these don't exactly match the statistics that Kim just said, but I think that's because of what was mentioned about the transiency of the schools, that if we're looking at something that's from one point in the school year, you know, there's been a little bit of change in the students. That's probably why it doesn't exactly reflect, but generally you can see the same trend happening here. And these are the statistics of people who have housing insecurity in our, um, in our whole supervisory union. So the students are in blue and then the student families in green, the percentage of how many of them are experiencing inadequate housing. So that looks like a, a slight decline, which is good. This year's data was 1718 today, so we still have Okay. There could be more homeless or housing insecure people as the year goes on. Are you having trouble seeing these? There are seats available up here. Do you, should I try turning the lights down so that they can see better for these? Okay, there's, there's not too many more slides. The print is quite small on these, but the, there will be larger print on the other ones. Yes? What would account for the difference between students and families? It's probably families that have more than one child. I'm, I'm guessing that's why. It's a number higher of students than of families. And, okay, so David is going to do the next part on how we're dealing. Yeah, I get the easy part. What are we doing about all this? <clears throat> uh, obviously, we're, we're doing a lot of things, and here are, are some of the examples we just um, heard today about a couple new ones, or actually a number of new ones. We heard about the after-school programs at Green Street, which includes kids going fishing. And we found out that our, our incoming principal at Academy School, Kelly Diaz, and Jody Batolki, the social worker that you just uh, just saw, uh, won a grant from the state to do a, a series of cooking classes that, which will culminate with the children making dinner for their families. So we're, the, the extent of things that we're trying to do is, is pretty broad and uh, it's really a, a, a balancing process because we're here for the academic part, but we can't do that if the kids aren't engaged and if they don't have the supports and if they don't have food and if they're not rested. and. Uh, and if they don't have other things that engage them. So I'm, I'm not going to read all this to you, but you can see it's a pretty extensive list of, of activities. And this is just part of it.
Yeah, it's on. It is on, okay. Um, you could hear the counselors really describing some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, and we're trying to meet those challenges with um, things that we're initiating at school. Um, a lot of trauma-informed professional development. Um, we have teachers regularly attending workshops. Um, we've made a connection with a psychologist in Burlington named Joelle Van Lent. Um, who's a leading expert around trauma-informed practices. Um, so we're doing direct staff um, engagement and professional development around building up our repertoire. Um, as, a st as staffs, we're doing um, book studies. Um, one we're doing right now is called Fostering Resilient Learners. So really focusing on building resilience in kids. Um, in each school, the third bullet, we have um, behaviorists that work in each school. So a behavior interventionist is a teacher who is board certified behavior analyst who works with um, staff members on developing behavior plans and supporting um, <coughs> students who need really intense behavioral support. Um, as part of um, the BCBA in each school, we have paraeducators who are registered behavior technicians. And again, that is um, um, something that um, these pairs have gone to school for and focused on behavior. Um, Jerry's gonna talk more about our step intensive program that these folks work out of. Um, but these are things that have um, evolved over the last handful of years in terms of supporting our children and things that we really need to have in place in our schools. Um, to build up resilience and um, student engagement. Oh, next slide. Uh, the first one is mine as well. Um, last year, Academy School added a social worker to their staff. Um, and that's, I think Andy can speak to the um, great success they've had with that position. Um, I think you can probably tell from the counselors in the, in the video um, that we felt moving forward in this year's budget, um, Green Street School would like to hire a social worker for next year. Um, we have a really phenomenal counseling program. However, our counselor um, has taken on the role of social work outside of school as well as counseling during the school day. Um, so we, we really need a partnership um, to help um, balance our programming and focus more on counseling with kids during the school day and having another um, dedicated staff member to um, establishing relationships in the community, um, identifying services for families um, who need it. Um, so that's the rationale for us moving forward co to continue to um, build the supports that we feel we need to um, successfully meet the needs of our, of our population right now. Thanks, Mark. Um, so behavior programs. So uh, we're hearing a lot about building resilience and overall how to establish and maintain um, a positive uh, school climate where all students can feel as though they belong and they feel that they can um, be successful. So one of the programs that um, some schools are involved with is called um, PBIS, or Positive Behavior Intervention Supports. Um, there are other t um, similar models out there, but the, basically the, um, the premise of a PBIS program is um, a school-wide approach to design positive culture, setting um, similar classroom expectations, um, uh, behavioral expectations that you practice and you model with students. What's, uh, what, what do we do when we're in the hallway? What do we do and how do we um, act when we're in an assembly? How do we, um, what does it look like when we're in a classroom? So those are all school-wide expectations that they're the same like at Oak Grove uh, they're the sa and really all of our schools. Um, may have they may look differently at each school but again it's the same language um, K all the way up to grade six as we move up the MTSS and you um, there might even be a slide later on I think about the MTSS and MTSS is really is like a triangle so what's good for all students 
um, it is certainly um, our premise, but we know that students that are coming to us um, that have trauma backgrounds, they have stressors from the homeless, um, being um, insecure housing, insecure um, uh, food, may not really be ready um, to meet the demands of their academics during the day. And so they need additional, oftentimes it will show um, in their behavior, and so they need additional supports for that. And that's why we have other um, programs such as a planning room, uh, check-in, check-out programs, and then our step room. Um, and our step room and step stands for supportive teams for educational progress. Um, Mark talked about the staff that are um, in the step rooms, and you know there. Um, the beauty that I see with with students; these are students who might have otherwise, um, you know, been like in in our office, um, calling parents all the time, maybe um, suspending students. Um, not allowing them to go to recess. STEP program is helping these students so that they can be successful um, throughout the day. Um, providing supports for teachers, um, helping to model for teachers, um, helping students, um, you know, prepare and for what it means to, to be in class. So they're giving the, the top of the tier, which is, you know, maybe 10, 5 to 10 percent of our student population in our classes, and it may not be that high, but um, it's um, a very small percentage of our students, a lot of um, daily ongoing support. And we're seeing um, tremendous growth. And, and students that need that when they come in, possibly kindergarten, first grade, the success rate is that they grow, they we're seeing them gr kind of grow out of the program, if you will, um, that all of a sudden they needed like somebody with them almost on a one-to-one, -one, and then they start to kind of drift away, and it's like, you know what, I've got this. I know how to be a student. I, I can be in first grade all by myself. I can do my math, and I know that it's hard, but I'm not going to freak out and, you know, over it because I can, I've learned how to raise my hand. I've learned how to ask for help. I've learned how to um, take a, a mindful uh, breath if I'm, um, I'm feeling, feeling a little stressed. So all of those things are things that we do with um, all kids. But then again, some of the kids just need that little extra um, support. Well, as you can see, um, we really feel pretty, believe pretty firmly that we're uh, educating the whole child. Um, and what I want to talk to you right now is about nutrition. So. Um, you know, we know that there's a, a link between uh, what we eat and, um, and our health. And um, uh, so we've made dramatic changes in our, uh, in our food program, nutritionally speaking, um, because frankly, a lot of the foods that, that we eat today, or kids eat today, are, are harmful. Um, um, there's um, toxic, uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of the ingredients in our food has really been proven to be very unhealthy. Um, so we've eliminated those and have created a very uh, healthy menu. So for example, we've, we've eliminated in the last couple of years um, all trans fats. Um, so we don't serve anything with trans fats. Uh, we've eliminated corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup. Um, those are neurotoxins. Um, eliminated added sugar. We have sugar limits on, on um, how much sugar that students can, can get in our meals. For example, uh, cereal for breakfast. Um, many cereals were contained as many as um, 20 grams of sugar. Um, uh, a child should have uh, daily allowance for sugar is about 25 grams. So at breakfast, we had students getting 50 uh, or more grams of sugar just for breakfast. So we've dramatically reduced that. We don't serve cereals, for example, that have more than two grams of sugar now. So significant changes there. Um, eliminated other things that had added sugar. Um, we've reduced the amount of simple carbohydrates that, that kids eat for healthier um, complex carbohydrates. 
um, increased protein, increased amount of veggies that we serve. Um, a lot of kids don't like vegetables, for example, spinach. A lot of kids will turn their nose on spinach, but we found ways where they can get spinach and don't tell them they don't know it um, by pureeing it, for example, and putting it into uh, tomato sauce. Um, the kids love it, but they only know that, this, you know that they're getting a healthy dose, a healthy helping of spinach in the meal in that manner. Um, and we've also done things like increased fatty acids with uh, omega-3 fatty acids in our meals. So uh, it took a while. It took a lot of work to get there. Um, and we, we contract out for our food services um, to a vendor. To a vendor. Um, it's a Boston accent. It's a vendor in Boston. Um, here it's a vendor. But um, so we've made... Um, but it was a real challenge for them because there's no schools in Vermont, there's no little public schools uh, anywhere in New England that's offering this kind of menu um, to them. So we're kind of leading the way on that. And um, you know, I think we're all proud of, of those changes. And as a result, we think we have much healthier kids. So the topic of diversity really builds on many of the concepts you've already heard about tonight, but it's a major focus of the Brattleboro Town Schools. Um, when we talk about building culturally responsive learning environments, we're, we're not talking about just one practice or one thing that happens or one time of day. We're actually talking about practices that permeate the entire school day. It's really thinking about it in terms of a suite of practices, some examples of those um, types of activities associated with building this kind of environment would include building responsive relationships in a classroom that really acknowledge the social and political context of students' experiences in our community, um, thinking uh, really explicitly and deliberately about the literature and texts and music that we choose um, to engage in with our students, thinking about our family engagement strategies um, in our school buildings um, and our town as a whole, and really paying attention to instructional practices that allow all students in our classrooms to engage the most rigorous levels of learning um, and really affirm and validate students' experiences. Um, in 2013, Act 77 was passed um, by Vermont. That is the Flexible uh, Pathways Initiative um, we've heard a lot about it at BOHS, but it actually has implications for our elementary schools too in the sense that it's an exciting time in the state of Vermont where people are really paying attention to how do students engage in learning and what do we know about the brain and what needs to be in place for students to really get excited about their learning. And that totally ties into um, our efforts in Brown Road Town to, to build culturally responsive learning environments that allow all students to feel like I really belong here, I want to get the most out of my education, I am uh, learning at my highest level here. So work is always done at um, Brattleboro Town Schools around some of the concepts have already been mentioned. Um, book groups, professional development that is offered on site. We also um, focus at grade level meetings on these topics uh, regularly, and it's a big focus on the um, administrative team as well, so that we can continue this ongoing work. So special support, differentiation. Differentiation is uh, each classroom teacher working to provide a variety of options for students in their classroom, a variety of ways for students to show what they know, a variety of ways of teachers um, teaching the concepts that need to be addressed in a classroom. Um, we work with teachers with differentiation. Our goal is to keep students in the regular ed classroom as much as possible throughout the day. However, we do have interventions um, often uh, offered through academic support teachers. Um, we have special education classes for students that need really very specialized programming. And as I think it was David talked earlier, we have many after school opportunities. Um, some of them are those that you saw, but we also have a very vibrant after school tutoring program so that students that might need additional time with academics can get that after school as well. So does it all make a difference? Does the, do the things that we just heard about 
in addition to all of the great instruction that happens every day in classrooms in Brattleboro, does that work make a difference? One way we can look at that is in terms of student performance data. One way to look at it, uh, it would be sort of large scale assessment data that look at how students perform sort of at a high level in English language arts, mathematics, and science. And we have data here from the most recent uh, assessment last spring, the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consor Consortium statewide assessment. The bars that you see are each of the schools, Academy is here, Oak Grove is here, Green Street is here. The line represents the uh, average for the state for grades three through eight. And then there are other schools in the district, um, the middle school and the high school compared to the state. Yeah, I moved it. I think I moved. I thought I moved it down. Anyway, so the average for WSCS, uh, sorry, for the state three to eight is there. Oh, I moved a different one, and that's that. The comparison really uh, for here is the is to this state average. There's the district average, and there are each of the schools, uh, Academy and Green Street slightly below the state uh, average for grades three through eight. Uh, Oak Grove well above that average. English language arts includes reading, writing, listening, and speaking, and research. And then here are the math data. Um, again, Academy, Oak Grove, Green Street. Uh, the bar actually for grades three through eight is up here at 47%. Again, um, uh, Academy and Green Street are close to that bar, and uh, Oak Grove is above that bar. That's for mathematics, includes concepts and applications, problem solving, communication, and reasoning. Okay. Science data, um, the state average is for fourth grade is up here at 48%. And uh, you can see Academy, again, Academy, Oak Grove, and Green Street, uh, Academy uh, well above uh, the average, the other two close to that average. Okay? And then, oh, uh, it's on to the next slide. Great. Who has that one? One of the ways that we are measuring our success is through parent um, surveys. And we've been uh, doing this survey at least since 2011, uh, 2013, excuse me. Um, here are just some of the statistics. It's out of a 4.0 scale um, about adults feeling welcome when they come in the school, very high. This was the highest that we've scored since doing this, um, 3.89. Um, 3.72, parents agree that their children's receiving a quality education. And, um, most of our students feel like that there's at least one adult they can go to where there's a question or an issue. You'll see that our lowest, actually our lowest score on the whole survey is students feeling safe on the bus. Uh, this is something that we know and we are working on, but it's always good for us to uh, make sure that we are looking at what parents are thinking and re, re, um, going back to that and looking at what is it that we're doing to address these needs. So you heard from the experts that the way that we are helping our students to be successful is by <clears throat> working with the families. And that's what we do best at Early Education Services and our Head Start and Early Head Start program, as well as our Parent Child Center designation. I have some statistics for you that were um, a, a, combina or a culmination of the data that we collect at the end of our program year. So what you're looking at tonight is what we collected in August representing the 2017 year. We are funded in Head Start and Early Head Start for 184 students. We actually, we actually had 211 families um, and some of that is due to the transient issue that we heard about earlier. And of those families, we referred 18 to the w Women's Freedom Center or we worked with um, victims of domestic violence to get services that they needed. We worked, we had 17 parents who asked for help around their substance abuse addiction issues. We worked with them. We supported 205 parents in parenting workshops and those included things like finances, um, parenting education, we do some young mothers groups, we actually work with pregnant moms too. And um, 207 families 
uh, where we helped them to um, make sure that their children had access to a medical home. And then again, we had 15 families who we did some budgeting work with and financial management. There were 41 reports that our staff made to the Department of Children and Families last year for reports of suspected child abuse or neglect. We helped 63 families find mental health services, and we made sure that 225 children had access to dental care. slide is, sorry, is um, just represents the um, IEP students in Brattleboro Town, um, K through 6, as a percentage of total enrollment. Total enrollment. Um, special education students are students um, who are eligible for specialized instruction and they meet disability criteria. We have uh, 12 disability categories in the state of Vermont per the Vermont regs. And these are students who uh, present with a disability which has an adverse effect on their educational um, learning and they require specialized instruction and basic skill areas in order to make progress in the general education curriculum. So this represents um, our data since 2010. At Academy is in the blue, I don't have a pointer, <laughs> and uh, Green Street is in the red and Oak Grove is in the gray. Um, the last data point for, that is available at the state level um, comes from 2015. Uh, that's called child count data, which is available on the Vermont AOE website if you want to look into that further. Um, the state average special ed rate was 15.9%. So when we look at the data point in 2015, we can see that all three town um, elementary schools are under that state average. So. Despite some of the challenges that we're facing, um, generally our, our special ed rates are lower than the state average. Um, this last slide has to do with, if I could get there, uh, students who are on IEPs in special education who require outside placements. Um, it, it is rare, but there are times when the um, needs of a student cannot effectively be met in a uh, general education environment. So an IEP team may place a child in what we call an outside placement. That would be a school that is not their um, home school or our neighborhood school, where they can get the specialized um, mental health or medical or um, behavioral support that they need um, to be successful. So um, we've done a really great job, I feel, over the last um, several years in um, educating more students in their neighborhood schools um, and that is really a testament to the uh, work of our behavior supports, our multi-tiered system of support for behavior, and also um, the teaming that we're able to do with classroom teachers through our behavioral um, supports, PBIS and STEP. And so we've, we've actually reduced um, that number from 15 and a half percent in 2009 of our IEP students being placed um, in an out-of-district placement down to about 5% today. And one of the things Shelley isn't saying, but it, that actually has a direct impact on the budget. Um, the out of placement can be, I think the cheapest we've seen is somewhere around 60 a year. 60,000 a year. And that's on the low side because we've seen some go as high as 300,000 a year, maybe, for one student. So the more we can do, um, at the earliest ages, the better off we are. I think some of that data shows that, I think it particularly look at Academy was the first school that started with some of these intensive services and Academy is one of the ones that goes down um, most dramatically quickest on those charts. Also Green Street was a little slower behind the other two schools and you'll see that I think in some of the scores that are coming up. We only showed you one year, we didn't give you a comparison and Green Street ends up looking like the child that needs more help at the moment, but the, the child's getting a lot of help. We, uh, that those scores are moving and, and the same sort of supports are being put in place there too. Were there questions that anybody had on this part of the presentation before we go to money? George. Yes, George. Do you want, there's one in the middle, yep. Two questions. 
question, sorry, on, on different parts of the presentation. Early on, you showed parents unemployment, am I right? That was for the early education services for the kids, the pregnancy right. through about kindergarten. 57% had jobs, which means? Either had have, jobs or working towards employment. Had jobs or working towards, which suggests, therefore, that 43% are unemployed. That seems out of filter with, I understand, Brattleboro's unemployment rate. Or That's not about? for the school population. It was for Head Start and Early Head Start, which is targeted specific populations of kids that are um, in families that in need. So that's why it's so high for that. It's because that's why they're there. Right. I, it's, so the point is that the unemployment rate in that population is significantly higher than the general unemployment rate. That's what, right, but it also am I reading that right. Yes, but it's also single. It may be single moms at home with no other. You know how how do you work and have? And, and Fine, I'm just trying to understand exactly. And that number also includes Westminster because we do have West. Yeah, the, the, yeah, Kim is just saying that that number includes Westminster as well because remember we oversee because of early Head Start and Head Start programming that's a Wyndham County wide, so that be overseen by happens to be us. So we actually have two locations up in Westminster as well as three, four locations here in Brattleboro. The here in this school, um, actually anybody wants to see. Okay, so there's a new preschool here, and it's actually right out that door if anybody wants to pop your head in while you're here. And that's our newest Head Start program. Second question, George. Uh, in, this, in the section where you talked about what I'll call the after school programs, uh, uh, NYT, uh, the, um, I can't rattle them off, but the various extracurricular activities, you've, you know the slide I'm talking about. I'm curious about how many what percentage of the students are involved in those? And that's great to have all of those. Yes, that's the slide. But if only 10% of the students are involved, yeah. So, so Mark, no, Mark just was telling us for Green Street for the spring enrollment, he's at 92% of the population. Um, some, that they normally hit at least 70%, and I think that's probably true for the other two schools as well. Yes, sir. I appreciate Sorry. My name is Mike Hoffman. I'm a town member, new, new town member, I think. Um, my question addresses um, the uh, description that Andy was describing about the um, nutrition, the efforts for nutrition, and I agree totally how important that is in the immediate and the long term to do that. And my, uh, I think my question is um, whether this is reactive in response to the need or following the, um, the, the consensus or the herd, or is it more strategic and intentional because in um, southern Vermont here, there's a, and also to understand more about the vendor, if it's one vendor or, or something, because in southern Vermont, there's a huge amount of local resources available for food from whether it be creative types or sources or CNS or the co-op or whatever, and it really could be like an integrative I'm sure um, Andy wants, effort. but I, I just point out that the cheese was Grafton cheese tonight. We tried to find local stuff to bring in for tonight too and, and <coughs> keep in line with our nutrition program so the carrot muffins are something that the kids get on a regular basis. Carrot quinoa muffins. Yes, yeah, so um, it was intentional, it, it was um, proactively, um, and we do take uh, high advantage of, of the, our geographical area, um, and we, we buy as much local produce as we possibly can. Um, it's obviously easy, easier at certain months of the year than others, but um, we do, we have a, um, a program with local farms um, we buy a lot of our produce from local farms. Um, we buy our apples, for example, from uh, uh, Miller Farms here in, in Brattleboro. So we buy um, uh, 
as much as we can locally. Um, we buy as much as we can organically. Um, well, the program uh, is farm to school program. Um, we also get a grant for healthy snacks where um, all kids get a healthy snack in school. The produce portion of the snack is paid for through the grant, uh, no cost to parents. And um, we incorporate uh, a lot of activities with that to, to encourage kids to try things that they wouldn't try, like um, spinach and broccoli and cabbage and so forth. Um, so, it's, um, so it's all the things that you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, a question regarding the backpack program. I just wondered if there was adequate food available to provide that uh, resource for the kids. Uh, there's situations in town that I'm aware of where we throw away a lot of good food from cafeterias, and I know there are rules about which can do with that food, but I want to make sure you have enough food to give to them to bring home. Yeah. So first I'll just clarify what the Backpack Food Program is. That's a program that all three town schools take advantage of through the Vermont Food Bank. And currently at Academy School, we give out 75 bags every Friday for our kids of non-perishable items, um, some canned foods, a cereal, a snack, a soy milk, um, and they really love it. We have several families who are enrolled, and then we also give out bags to kids who might just want to take one as a sample that day. Um, in addition to that, we also have a cooler available every day after lunch where our extra food is packaged, labeled, and out just for that day so kids can take it and every afternoon it is emptied um, might be peanut butter and jelly might be a yogurt parfait um, but kids head out for dismissal and they're having that snack on their way out so we are trying to really reduce our waste and utilize our services any other questions from anybody yes please wing so absent from, from your presentation, and I applaud everything you're doing because if you don't do the, do the stuff you're doing now, it'll be too late. So I don't want to denigrate anything that, you, that you're doing, but I heard nothing about the top 5%. What are you doing for them? Are they just so self-sufficient that you don't have to worry about them? So we, no, <laughs> that was, um, yes, and I thought about that when we were putting this together, and I thought we, maybe we should talk a little bit more about that, but we wanted to talk about the trauma and the, the effects. So if we go back in those slides, those extra programs that are the full experience for everyone, all of those programs are open to everybody in the school, um, no matter where you're at. But then you've also heard them talk a little bit about MTSS, which is one of the many acronyms that they all give us all the time. That one stands for multi-tiered systems of support. And I think Lyle had mentioned it, where there's a, a, a level that everybody gets, and then there are levels that other people, uh, certain students need. But there, it also goes the other way. If the, if the kids are advanced, they have ways to push those kids forward as well. There's a um, Brattleboro Enrichment Education Program. It's in our budget called BEEP. My husband always liked to make fun of that. He called it honk. But in any case, it's a program that the kids don't, don't even really realize that they're being separated out and getting extra um, challenge at the same time as there's kids being separated out and they're getting extra support. So it's a, a really lovely way that it melds all of those kids together and gives everybody what they need. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. The, the, next, the next question I have is uh, sensitive. Um, I heard a lot of euphemisms and not a lot of specifics, and I don't know if you think we can't handle it, but stressors, trauma, food security, behaviorist intervention, all the acronyms. Could, could you be a little more specific 
about the kinds of things you're dealing with, and I, I know the kinds of things you're dealing with, but when you ha use euphemisms, it separates your real meaning from the reality. So part of that is confidentiality of, of why we, we don't stand leave, up and You can leave the it. names and specifics out, but. So I, I think I'll throw it to somebody at that table. Oh. Mark. <clears throat> So one of the things in the presentation we talked about was the acronym of an ACE. And an ACE is an adverse childhood experience. So an adverse childhood experience could be um, divorce, could be um, addiction, could be abuse, mental health issues in the family, um, incarceration of parents, um, or neglect. Um, so these services in terms of um, you know, behavioral interventions and social worker support for families are um, a direct correlation to ACEs that um, children come to school with. I don't know if that answered your question directly enough, but those are the, the themes of, of issues that we're dealing with on a, on a day-to-day -to -day basis. Um, in terms of um, enrichment, I'd just like to go back to that. We all have um, enrichment teachers at our school, but I feel like we also offer enrichment to all kids at our schools. Um, we're inclusive schools. All kids um, um, are in class together for tier one core math and literacy instruction, as well as specials and social studies and science. But within our schedule, we also have dedicated um, what we call tier two and um, tier three or wind blocks dedicated to our schedule. So tier two, an example of a tier two is all kids um, during tier two are working in small groups um, with targeted <coughs> instruction. Um, some of those small groups during tier two time could be intervention, kids who need extra support with say reading fluency. But during that same time period, there could be kids um, getting enrichment opportunities, so extending the curriculum. And then um, we also have dedicated time at Green Street, we call it our WIN block, which is an acronym, acronym for what I need. And that's a third dose. And again, that could be a third crack at the apple in terms of intervention, so to really provide that intense intervention that students need. Or it could be another opportunity for en en enrichment, focused on math or um, a study of interest or um, literacy. Our after school programs, um, I'll just read off some of the things that we do after school. Um, we have school musicals, um, we have many arts clubs, a clay club, a mural painting club. We're taking kids fishing this spring, um, teaching kids how to play guitar, um, poetry clubs. Um, we have about 60 kids registered for a running club this spring, um, cooking club, um, STEM activities, um, which we call makerspace. And um, Jill had said it, but about 70% of our kids participate throughout the school year in those after school activities. Um, this spring, we actually have 90%. So um, I think, I think we, we, what we offer our kids in Brat Town is unique, and I think it's really special um, compared to other schools. There was a couple of questions in the back. You guys want to run over to the mic and find out which one wants to go first. Hello, HB, Lazito District 2. Uh, I wanted to celebrate the all-gender bathrooms that are in Oak Grove School, and thank you all for that. Um, and then I remembered this board passing something related to affirming students being able to use uh, gendered facilities that align with their gender identity, but I can't remember if that happened and what it was, and if that did happen, if you could give an update about what's happened since then. It did happen. It happened on the supervisor union level. Um, Paul's probably looking up exactly the wording. The policy. The Thanks. policy. It was a pretty long policy, but <laughs> we can find it exactly. Yeah, I think it wasn't just about bathrooms. It was a gender affirming overall school mm -hmm. culture and bathrooms were one element that was mentioned in that. Exactly. And let Robin talk about that. You may want to mention the training we did too, Robin. Yeah, well, did you find the yeah, yeah. policy? Do you, would you like to hear the policy? It's too long for me it's, to uh, Let me just see it and I'll, I'll sum up the basic bullet points here. 
Okay. So the the policy is designed for to provide direction for administrators, staff, students, and parents to address issues that may arise concerning the needs of transgender and gender creative students. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 and 9 SA 4502 protect all students from sex discrimination, including transgender students and students who do not conform to traditional st gender stereotypes. It is the policy of the Wyndham Southeast Supervisory Union to provide a safe, orderly, civil, and positive learning environment for all students, regardless of perceived or actual sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. And then it goes through a bunch of definitions of what um, some of the relevant terms mean, um, but it talks about student privacy, how the student should be addressed, their pronouns, um, and uh, student records. Um, so that's what it, it covers all of those things, and the bathroom element, I think, it just falls under Great. one aspect of it. Cool. Is there a place that I can find that? I think it's easily uh, on the SU website. Okay. Under policies. I've looked for it. Thank you. Under schools. Great. SU policies. Perfect. Thank you. Was there one more question or are we one more? And then I think we're heading to money. Two more. Two more. Nancy Anderson. I'm familiar with some of the music that's in the schools, but I wondered if you would talk to the group about fine arts in that list. Is extension bands, music bands? Is yes. There, any, any, there, there yeah. is an after school band program. There's also, um, I think I'm looking at you guys, I think it's called the, the writing composition. We do strings program, um, jazz band, um, extension band. We actually have some rock bands mm -hmm. that we do as well. I know I'm in one of the groups with our intergenerational chorus, but um, the, it, it isn't very descriptive, the list, to tell what really is going on in, in the arts, and I just want everybody to know that. Yeah, there's a, it's such a long list, we didn't put it all up. No, I there's, understand. There's a lot. And these are just the enrichment ones, but that doesn't count what's going on during the school day. And I think another nice tradition that we have at, at our schools in Brattleboro, we have weekly school sings. So each week we come together as a community, um, sing songs, learn songs, dance, um, and that's a well-established tradition for um, Brattleboro. Um, and there's also art night that is more of the painting, drawing, ceramics, and those are really kind of fun to walk through. The schools are festooned with art. It's really cool. One more question. Hi, Alex Fisher, District 2. Um, I had a question about supporting diversity with the students. So my understanding is about 20% of students in Brattleboro identify as students of color. That population is growing. The staff absolutely does not reflect that percentage. And additionally, there is a rising number of youth in elementary schools that are coming out as queer and trans as the gender identity policy just reflected. Um, and the mentioning of supporting students was mostly in classrooms, and I'm wondering what additional services are being provided for things like school safety on the buses, for queer kids, kids of color. Um, and this year, with the almost losing of the only diversity, diversity coordinator position for the entire district happening, what is being done um, for the Brattleboro district around possibly implementing more positions around supporting diversity or things that are happening between classrooms and outside of simply the classroom experience. So I think Lyle, I'll kick it to you if you can get the microphone down. We, just to let you know that we recently did make um, sure we advertised in a lot of places for our most recent hiring of a principal. Kelly on the end is just hired tonight as Andy's replacement for next year and they're on. But um, we did advertise and try to make sure that we did a wide search as well and in various places looking specifically for diversity and put some extra funds towards that. Although hiring from within is also something that we train and we have in our budget that we help people move up and so we're happy to also do that. 
So as so far as hiring goes, um, we use what traditionally is used with uh, hiring teachers, which is called SchoolSpring. And there is a section in SchoolSpring where you can uh, check it off and it will advertise in um, traditionally uh, teachers of color, uh, Asian, Hispanic um, websites so that we are trying to draw in more, uh, more teachers. Unfortunately, there is a shortage of teachers everywhere. And we feel like we're working as hard as we can to get people in. Uh, I sit on a community equity um, committee, which involves everybody from the community, because it's more than just a school issue. Once we have people here, they need to be able to have housing. They need to be able to have places where they can get their hair cut, foods that they might want. So uh, I think David Scholes also sits with that group. And so we, are, we recognize that it's the school plays a part of it, but as do all the companies in the area. So far as teachers training, um, the administrative group has been working. Um, I've been working with Ariel Nelson, who's helped us, uh, directed us towards some um, resources we're using as a full leadership team. Um, and then those, uh, some of the things that we do are brought back to the staff, um, different articles, always looking at what we're doing to create a safe community for all of our students. So specifically, I'm also curious about the diversity coordinator position and how that could possibly be extended, if not in this fiscal year budget, in the future to extend the number of staff that are responsible for diversity and ensuring the safety of those students. Um, right now, it's my understanding it's only one position for all the elementary schools, the middle school, and the high school. And so is it has it been talked about, or is it a possibility for adding a position specifically for the elementary schools to allow two people to do that job, which is incredibly overwhelming right now? We would need to budget that for next year. I'm certain that it's something that uh, we can discuss. Uh, as you mentioned, it's impossible for one person to be able to meet all the needs. Uh, so right now, our diversity coordinator is really focusing on BUHS, BAMS, and the Career Center. Um, and we need to look at how we can extend that to the elementaries. Great, awesome. So it'd be great to see that in the future. Thanks. Alex, a couple more uh, examples, because we haven't hired a, an HR person like the town did to help uh, implement that goal, but we're working with the town and most of the employers in the community toward a diverse workforce, and, the, uh, and it is a cultural and community-wide <clears throat> effort. As a school board, we are, Robin has uh, been doing a lot of research, and we, the board and the administrators are going to get uh, the, the anti-bias, inclusive, um, anti uh, that training that whole process training, and um, it probably in June, we're trying to schedule right now, and then we're gonna be looking at, uh, at sustaining that with the staff. And the town is doing that as well, so it's a, those are some pretty significant efforts that'll make a difference. The hiring is really an issue, as, as Lyle said, there are just very few people that wanna to go to teaching because of this, largely because of the circumstances that they're presented with. It's even worse in, in the early ed and in pre-K. and. Um, but we also specifically set aside uh, uh, an amount of money during the uh, search for the principal and, and contacted the, the, uh, the Vermont Partnership to help uh, try to identify qualified candidates of color. And, and we'll continue to do that, I'm sure. I guess um, in terms of, it might be interesting to look at the discrepancy then of the internal policy of supporting hiring from within and recruiting folks of color to be in positions as that seems to not We don't have well. a policy of hiring from Oh, I thought you were saying there is something about supporting no, I, staff. I said we had a, um, we, it, a we have a bill, ability we pay as part of the professional development for people to move up from being teachers mm -hmm. and that's part of what they can do is become principals and we have a mentoring program and so we're cultivating people within. But we actually took pains to, as David's explaining, and I tried to explain, I think, poorly before, to try to make sure that we reached out specifically to be more inclusive and more diverse. Yeah, and I guess I just, I, the summary for me is both hiring is hard and that absolute shortage of teachers. And so positions like the diversity coordinator are ways to bring in folks that maybe aren't specifically elementary school educators, but also can bring in those skills into the town. So. But I, and I appreciate all the efforts. I know this is 
a town-wide conversation for the government, for the schools, for the community. And so thanks for um, taking some time. Um, I just want to clarify because it did sound a little bit like you were saying that we have a one option of hiring from within but I think what uh, it really what she really meant was that the we provide opportunities for teachers to learn to become administrators but when we do a job search there's no advantage given to internal candidates they are the same as anyone else applying for the job and we you know as a board try to select the person that we think is the most qualified for the job regardless of our prior knowledge of that person okay so I think we oh Andy has one more thing grab your microphone over there and then we I think we're putting going into budget which maybe you're all just excited that it's down and we can go home I don't, we'll see France doesn't look that way <laughs> I just wanted to follow up with that, that, that what we have found is that there's a shortage um, of hiring, there's a shortage of professionals. It's, it's um, in, in, in our community, it's very difficult to hire professionals in any uh, industry. Um, but in the school level, we have had, we've had very small applicant pools for teachers, for um, certainly for the behavior interventionists that um, they didn't, ex they don't exist, we couldn't find them. Uh, teachers, uh, principals, behavior interventionists. So what we've done is we started to train to train our folks in, uh, to do those things, and we've created um, internship programs. So we have an internship program right now for teachers. We work with um, Antioch College, and we have um, this year at Academy School we had four. Uh, people we hired as paraprofessionals who have a bachelor's degree and they're getting a master's degree in uh, teacher education um, through through our program. We supervise them. It's a very intensive program, um, and we have we have found some great applicants that way. Um, we do a similar thing with for principals, um, and we do uh, a similar thing for behavior interventionists because there's a tremendous shortage for those throughout the country, and in Vermont. Um, there's behavior interventionists in Burlington and uh, Brattleboro. And our behavior interventionists start off as paras. They work for us for a couple of years and they continue the training. They get the advanced de degree and they become licensed behavior interventionists while we supervise them with a licensed behavior interventionist. So it's really, it's a unique model, but, it, uh, but I just wanted to point out that it's just not for administrators and the, the response is because we, we have to train people and we have to find unique ways to bring people to the community. Okay, I think we're going on to budget then, yes? So uh, the article that you'll be voting on on Saturday uh, explains and because of the, it's a legal wording that has to be in there, it shows you the exact amount of the budget, which this year is $14,659,600. And that it also breaks that out as per equalized pupil. We've discussed that before in here. Uh, the equalized pupil is the magic solution that the state comes up with that balances out the needs of the student population and in, uh, it, well, it's whatever, it's, it's not really a page, nine. Article 29 on, on page nine in your yellow book. Um, the equalized student number then includes, is it three quarters for each? preschool student so it it combines all these things and when we're done our number this year is 16,356 there's also a state threshold number we are well below that and then the last sentence is also required by law this projected spending per equalized pupil is 3.1 percent lower than spending for the current year so we have submitted a budget to all of you that is lower. Um, we, tr we looked at it from the basis of several thoughts. One, what do we need to attend to the needs you've just heard about? Where do we want to put our efforts? And what new positions, if any, do we want to sustain, uh, create? Do we need to make changes in order to have those new positions? 
In this particular budget, we've brought forward one new position, which is a social worker for Green Street. Last year, you approved a new position of a social worker for Academy School. I think we've already discussed the needs and why um, the staff really felt for that. As David and I were talking about this morning on the radio, it, it, that's a hard decision as a board to present and to tell when decreasing student numbers keep going on, why do we want any new positions? But I think we've shown you tonight that's why we felt it was important to listen to that need. Um, then we looked at it from the tax perspective. What does that mean to the bottom line to all of us as taxpayers? Is that something that can is reasonable and support, um, supportable? And I believe Franz and, and his crew and the um, reviewing and looking at our work, uh, they've said exactly what we've said. It's not sustainable to keep taking any surplus and apply it. We've done it several times in the last few years. Um, what that surplus, we're not budgeting for a surplus every year, but when you have $16.5 million, there, it's easier to come up with a surplus than the outlying towns that have sm much smaller budgets. Um, small differences in something can mean larger amounts of money left over. It's just the way math works, of course. So we're fortunate in that, and we've had that surplus there. We've been able to use it when the equalized student numbers have been kind of wacky in the last couple of years. I think this year we felt like they were fairly where we expected them. Last year was way off, that suddenly we were way down. I think our actual student number had not decreased at all, and yet our equalized pupil number went down by a substantial amount. The year before that, we had a whole bunch of students that we suddenly had that we didn't really understand how we got so many on that equalized student number. So one of the nice things that we've had with that surplus is the ability to smooth out the increase or decrease in taxes that would come. I think that's all I have to say. Frank, if you wanted to say anything specific or do people want to ask specific questions? I'm not sure how, what's your pleasure at this point? We are at 8.30. Are there specific questions that, let me just ask real quick, Allison. One, one question, is there anybody who would like Frank to give a quick rundown before we go into questions? One, <laughs> two, okay, so Frank, you're on. Oh, okay, um, I think Jill did a nice overview. Um, so. I will be brief. Um, if you look at page 166 in your uh, book, um, it is a summary of uh, the revenues that fund uh, the district uh, proposed budget of 14 million uh, five uh, six fifty nine, um, and and then uh, you see the change up 112 thousand or less than 1% as the proposed budget is uh, very close to a level funded budget. Um, as Jill was referring to uh, fund balance, you see on page 166, we also have um, a summary of fund balance, uh, 1.1 million for the general fund and 407,000 uh, for the capital fund as of um, June of 2017. So our most recent fiscal year end uh, but then, uh, as you just heard, we we have a proposal um, to utilize uh, some of that fund balance. So uh, if the budget runs as proposed through the end of uh, June of 2019, that's our end of fiscal year 19, um, you would see, we would project those fund balances of 644,000 in the general fund and 377,000 in the uh, capital fund, which still represents about 7%. You know, 1,022,000 is about 7% of our total um, operating budget, which um, we feel is sustainable um, and uh, responsible. So, so there's sort of a quick snapshot. Um, I'll, I'll come back to page 167. That's the tax uh, data um, and the derivation of it based on a required document that the state provides uh, and asks that are in, is included in the um, annual meeting uh, budget. Um, 
so the following pages, uh, 168 through about 177, I will just highlight very quickly um, what it represents and maybe comment on things that you've heard this evening in terms of programs. So um, at the top left of every page, we try to make sure you can see what school district you're looking at. Um, so on page 168, um, you see Brattleboro Town School District budget, you see the uh, columns of data, and then, and then I'm pointing out uh, that in, in the page 168, district-wide programs, and then as you leaf through this, this book, you know, page 169 continues on district-wide. Um, the, the, uh, we, we get to the school districts um, starting on page uh, bottom of 170, and then you see at the top of the page, Green Street School, um, and then we go to Oak Grove School on page 173, and then uh, Academy School um, is on page 175. So, so the structure of the report is by, by school location. Um, District-wide means that it, there are programs that serve all three schools. So um, you heard a, a bit about, on page 168, the counseling program. So you see an increase in that budget, um, up 71,000. That's the social worker position that um, you heard a lot about this evening. Um, <clears throat> you know, other district-wide programs include the, uh, the, the music program, the um, nurse, uh, psychological services uh, for evaluations um, and um, I, I would brief comment there you see a quite an increase in testing on page 169 in psych services that that again responds to what you've heard about what where our students are at as they come into the school and the need um, to identify the types of interventions um, that are appropriate um, <clears throat> so moving Moving along to the um, schools, um, Green Street starts on the lower third of page 170. Um, and when we look at the total of Green Street, we would go to the bottom of page 172. And you see quite a, quite a decline there. We didn't talk much about uh, the capital uh, program, but th the reason why we see uh, uh, quite a bit of a decline is because, as you may recall, last year you approved a project, a heating system project, with a, a major capital investment that was at the Green Street School. That's going very well and um, on plan and on budget, uh, but we, we don't need to uh, sustain that, and that's why you see quite a decline in the total Green Street budget on page 172 at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> moving on to uh, Oak Grove on page 173, um, and that moves through page 174. Uh, the total for Oak Grove is at the very top of page 175, and you see that's a that's a, a, a stable investment in in the Oak Grove programs, um, up three and a half percent or 66,000 rep represents uh, really sustaining um, the excellent programs that are there, and then we have the academy school um, through the remainder of the report. Um, and uh, once again on page 177 at the very end, you see that, that same number that Jill uh, mentioned, uh, uh, 14,659, uh, eight tenths of one percent um, change. Uh, so. Uh, just one last comment, and then you, you may have questions. Um, coming back to page 167, uh, it, the tax calculation and what, what is the uh, estimated cost of this proposed budget for fiscal year 19? Um, maybe I'll mention right now that, um, uh, as Jill said, the Town Finance Committee has done an excellent job uh, analyzing this this document and, and the entire proposed budget. And you'll find on uh, the Brattleboro uh, Municipal website 
uh, the town finance report. You may have a copy. I don't know if that was distributed this evening, but um, it, yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. I saw it as a separate sheet in someone else's, and I didn't get the separate sheet. It's also on on the website. It's not bound, but it's oh, so I okay. didn't get that. Okay. I saw it somebody else had it. So I mention it because um, the Brattleboro Town Finance Committee took um, a good deal of time, I'm sure, um, to essentially interpret this document with much much more narrative. So I'll go through this very quickly, um, but I would urge you to look at um, the Brattleboro Town. Um, work in in essentially accessing the the state law and helping you understand um, the mechanics of the way the tax rate is set. So I'll I'll condense um, that into a one minute uh, overview. But um, here we go. Uh, page one sixty seven. You see the very top line. Um, line one represents the school board's proposed budget of fourteen million six fifty nine. Um, then we uh, are directed by statute to reduce the uh, the request for spending by uh, revenues that are received from various uh, entities, um, which essentially reduces the amount that we need to raise by taxes. Um, the, I mentioned on page 166, if you were interested in what are those revenues, uh, those are listed on page 166 in that summary document, the largest um, uh, amount of the 1,330,000 that is on line uh, 10 is uh, the uh, Title I uh, grant from uh, the federal government. It's a pass-through sent to the supervisor union that then subgrants it to the town school district. So obviously we don't need to collect taxes on that. The other, is, the other significant uh, resource is uh, the 330,000 that we're proposing to use from uh, reserves. As Jill mentioned, that was intentional and in that amount was, was derived uh, to uh, flatten the tax rate right out to zero. Um, for the Brattleboro Town proposal. Um, so we take our spending, 14659000 which we just very quickly reviewed, and uh, we reduce spending by $1,330,000, which I mentioned is Title I and, and the use of reserves with a few other small revenue sources. That, that leaves uh, what the state calls education spending, 13 million 329 the difference between those two numbers is on line 14 and that's 13 329 once again Jill mentioned how critical um, the statistic is as it relates to um, our student count so that's the next number in the formula line 15 it's the equalized student count um, you see on your document it's 814.93 students um, that that varies from 887 actual students. Um, the, the main difference is, uh, as Jill pointed out, our pre-K population only counts by uh, about a half, a, a statistic of 0.46. Um, and it has something to do with what the state considers a reasonable uh, allocation for the pre-K um, instructional resources that are consumed. So we take our spending, this net spending divided by our equalized students and we get the, the all important from the state funding formula uh, cost per equalized student. Um, without doing much else from that, you could move the decimal a, a couple of places and you've got your tax rate. Um, 16,356 is a, is a lot like 1.66 tax rate. Um, the little bit of difference is that the state has changed the denominator in which uh, they divide all public school proposed spending per students 
They've changed it from a number that was very close to 10,000. If they didn't change that number, it would be 1.63, but they changed it to 9,842, um, and that raises the tax rate. Uh, so I, I, um, I, I'll answer questions if you're interested in, in the, uh, that denominator, but I'll skip over it for now. It is an index that's set by the state, and it, it's essentially calculated based on an estimate of what are all schools in the state of Vermont going to spend and what is the grand list, the average grand list in the state of Vermont. And they, they set a number, they call it a yield, um, to uh, a raise an appropriate amount in the education fund to pay for public education in Vermont, which is about $1.6 billion. So we're almost done. Um, line 29 is the Brattleboro Towns uh, tax rate. It's simply spending per equalized student divided by that figure 9,842 that the state gives us. That that equals 1.662. So if you uh, have a hundred thousand dollar assessed house, that would be 1,662 dollars. And this is where Joe mentioned um, you compare that to the current year, and you see it's exactly the same, zero change in um, the Prattabro Town uh, equalized tax rate. Um, <clears throat> and that is despite the fact that our spending, as Jill mentioned also, is down um, from 16882 per student. It's down to 16356 uh, The reason why um, Spending is down per student, but our tax rate is up is because the state did lower the uh, de the, the denominator, the 10,160. Uh, they lowered it down to that 9,842. That created a 3% increase for everyone in the state from uh, step one. Whether you, you, you know, without spending another nickel, Fiscal year 19, the state created a 3.1% tax rate increase. The board used 330,000 in reserves and a level funded budget to mitigate that, uh, bring us back down to uh, no tax increase. So um, because Brattleboro Town uh, is a member of Brattleboro Union High School, we have to prorate um, the, the tax rates, because every school in the state does the same calculation. Um, but when you have a, a membership in a union, then the state looks at your population, uh, all, all of the kids. So they, they look at uh, kids at uh, Brattleboro Town and Brattleboro Union High School, and then they say, well, whatever the proportion that are in Brattleboro Town, you'll take that as a percentage of the $1.66, and then they look at the um, high school's tax rate. It's on line 35A, which is $1.77. And they'll take whatever proportion um, our K-12 population is, our pre-K-12 population is, and they'll multiply it times that $1.77. They'll add the two numbers together, and they will get the total tax rate that you will see. Um, however, we have one more adjustment, and that is the common level of appraisal. That's the change in the real estate values between what your tax assessed values are based on the lister's work and the actual um, real estate transactions that have occurred in the marketplace. Uh, for Brattleboro Town, CLA is 104.33, which means in, in, on average um, properties are selling for 4% uh, less than um, the tax assessed value. And therefore, your $1.71 on line 38 is adjusted down because they're saying your tax assessments are too high. Uh, so they, they reduce the $1.71 down to the $1.64. And that would be the estimated actual tax rate that you would, would see if the legislature changed to nothing. Um, but we know that's likely um, not to be the case, because you've probably heard a lot about proposed tax um, formula changes. But um, my, my guess is that um, 
they will restore the uh, the ten thousand dollar figure, and we will be closer to a zero percent tax impact. And my rationale for that is that they started with that 3% um, tax increase for everybody in the state because they estimated school boards would be passing budgets uh, with increases around 3%. The actual has come in about 1.7% across the state. And as you know, our own proposal is 0.8, you know, less than 1%. So I would anticipate they will, they will reduce this um, statistic. but. Uh, there it is, and once again, you, you'll you'll see this explanation in a in a uh, uh, more detail with your Brattleboro Town Finance Committee report. I, I did just find that. Is this on? I did just find that report. It is online for those of us who didn't get it in there. And Franz has done a remarkable job of breaking down a very complex thing, like Frank just went through. In case you'd like a primer, um, there was I guess the primer, and there's the follow up on how that works. Are there questions on the budget? Allison, yes. Allison Parkett, District 2. Um, I uh, thank you for this report, and I appreciate you um, bringing in a level budget. But I have a question about one of the ways that we got there with um, the building, the modular unit behind Academy School. And it says that you were planning to replace it at a cost of $640,000, and now that's been reduced by $400,000 um, to $240,000 in repairs to um, what is essentially like a double-wide trailer. So I'm wondering what, um, what kind of repairs would cost that much and whether that's a wise choice um, considering what you're working with, and is that a good investment of the town's money? Can I start with that, and maybe Andy has a comment? But, um, yes, it's a good point. In, in, um, uh, initially, there, there was a plan to um, propose a, uh, a new construction, tear, tear that modular down, and, and uh, um, propose new construction to the town. Uh, as part of our initial deliberations for the fiscal year 19 budget. Um, but um, the, the more we looked at it and uh, revisited the, the demographic changes, the enrollment changes um, that are occurring throughout all three buildings, um, uh, the board directed the administration to go back and uh, do a, a, a facility study across all three structures and the other two buildings that the uh, district owns um, and come up with a more comprehensive um, capital plan. So what we did was we, we left a significant amount of resources in there, as you've just pointed out, the 240,000. Um, but, but it's really not intended for a specific repair. And, and it it's highly unlikely that we will spend much uh, of that 240 on like a new roof for that structure. We'll make sure that it's safe and that it's um, functional, but that really is a reserve primarily for um, the, what ultimately we do think will be a, some sort of a construction uh, project that's required to um, accommodate uh, uh, what initially was pre-K programming, but what we also know is inadequate now where we have uh, uh, special um, uh, student service programs in closets and in uh, really inadequate spaces, particularly at at academy. So we know there, we know the need is there. Um, the 240 is is going to be really, I think, substantially going to increase our reserves that I mentioned in the capital fund, um, and and also fund a study. Uh, once we identify the, you know, the student need and the, the incompatibility in our current facility. Any other questions? Dora? Oh, sorry. You can go next. Dora Bubalis, District 3. Um, we've been pondering back here because we're a little confused by the food service budget. Um, what the actual cost is, what the budget is, because what we're only seeing is a line item for 65000 and we 
can't believe that that's the actual budget. So if you guys could, you know, give us a little more information on that. I'm going to refer that to Frank, too, so you can show him exactly where. Sure. Um, good question. Um, let me give you a very, very general reference for you. Um, and we can give you more information if you would like. On page 178 in the, bo in the book, um, you have uh, the supervisor reunion budget. And it is just a one-page um, summary document. Uh, and then we have this document also online on the website. So if I drew your attention to uh, the food service budget, which is about right in the middle of the page, it's the, it's the number right above the total. You see that proposed 1,478,000. What, what the state asked uh, all schools to do uh, in Vermont uh, initiated in 2012 and then it was required in 2015 is to consolidate certain um, services at the SU level as, as an attempt to create efficiencies. So um, that 1.4 million is the food service operations for the, the entire supervisory union, which includes Bradboro Union High School, Putney, um, Vernon, Guilford, and Dummerston, along with Bradboro Town. Um, and, um, it's, it's essentially a self-funded program with the contribution that you just noted, uh, the local shares that the um, school districts contribute to uh, uh, balance the difference between the program costs, the child nutrition USDA subsidies that come from the state and the federal government, and any other revenues that come from just student and or adult um, meal sales. So. Um, as I say, we, we do have a detailed report. Um, I believe it's on, on the website, but I can also send it to you as well that identifies within the 1.4 million, each district expenses and the revenues. Um, so for Brattleboro Town, it's about a $474,000 program. Um, and uh, of that, uh, the uh, state and federal funds uh, provide nearly 400,000 of that, and then you see the uh, local contribution, as you've noted, on, on the budget. So, um, in the elementary schools, it's in the academy school where they're, where they're preparing the meals and then sending it out to all the elementary schools, and then the middle school and the high school have one. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Your question was next. Emily Murphy, Ward 1. Um, I had three questions, actually. I think most of them probably are about the budget and Frank. Um, so one is, I noticed there was debt service for, um, I think it was something that was approved yes, uh, last year, and I was wondering, are there any other debts aside from the Green Street that would be included in the budget? I think mm -hmm. it was 36,000 increase this year. Yes, if you went back a couple of years, you would see that there was about 220,000 in debt service, and that was a bond for a, a project that was initiated 20 years ago and, and completed. Um, there was a, a year where we had no debt, and that's where we, we created the reserve for these um, projects that we've just talked about. Um, the 36,000 that you're referring to is, is anticipated for the Green Street project. Last year, the electorate uh, approved borrowing up to 350,000. Um, and we're, we're still evaluating to, to what extent we need to borrow. Um, we will do that right up until June of this fiscal year. Um, because there were funding sources that um, that we're applying for. We're very confident that they're going to come in, um, but until they actually are received, we, we won't go to the bank with the uh, request. But um, that 36000 was to pay the debt for a 10-year term on up to $350,000 loan, and that is the only debt of, that this district has. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other two questions were related to something um, that kind of we just went over. So one was, you had said the state funding formula changed 
I think you said this, from 10,000 10, to 9842. Um, so is that just a change in how they're, like, the baseline of how they're saying students, you know, the amount of money that should go towards each student being educated? Yeah, it, and, and sort of, not, not exactly. It, it, at one time, the school funding formula did have a block grant, and you would think of it in, that, in those terms, but um, that, that is not what this represents. Um, what that represents is a, it's a, a statistic out of several that the state sets, as I said, to raise enough funds for the, the education fund um, to uh, then distribute uh, money to all of the school districts in the state of Vermont. And the, the actual number, if you are interested, is um, it was, was 10,160, and if you wanted to kind of follow what the state has done over the past few years. Let me see if I can um, just find that line for you. It's uh, line 28. There's, there's unfortunately a very small uh, font under line 28, and it shows you what the state has done over the last four years. I'll, I'll read you the numbers because they might not be visible. Um, um, the first column is 9,285, the second column is 9,701, the third is 10,076, and they amended that to 10,160, and then uh, the 9,842, and it, it, is, it is not a, a form of cash payment, it is a mechanism to derive the tax rate, and the tax rate um, is what creates the cash flow to, to balance the, the school budget. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it, it would be incorrect to think that that's a check that comes in the mail yeah. associated with that number. Okay. Last quick question, sorry. Um, so I understood the changes and how you count, count pupils um, for, you know, bringing it down because maybe uh, early childhood, um, maybe the kids are half time or different things. Um, but I didn't really understand why you would change it for poverty. So what would be yeah. an example of that? Mm -hmm. So what the state has done there is um, identified, um, as you can see, a tax rate that's based on spending per student. So if you have more students, your spending per student is lower. The theory is that the board will take that lower cost per student, which you can now see is a direct uh, relationship to a tax rate, and instead of going to the electorate with a um, artificially low tax rate, um, they're going to reinvest in social workers and in the uh, interventions that you've heard of. And the Brattleboro Town uh, Board has done that and the community has supported that. Um, the point is is that um, without the equalization of point, it's a point two five assigned to every student that uh, the principals report to the Agency of Ed in October. Um, you see what that does is it, it takes if, if we just had 100 students and they were all in poverty, we would t take 125 students to the tax table. It would lower our cost um, per student. If we spent another 100,000, as we are doing, uh, for intervention, it would bring us to parity to the next community over, you know, downtown that doesn't have uh, the level of poverty that we have. So that's, that's the theory. It is a index, again, set by the legislature. Uh, the other index that's part of the equalization formula is a adjustment for um, English language learners. Uh, so that's a point two. They also adjust high school students by a point one three. And th those, are, those are all factors that are theoretically been developed in, in policy that says this is a, an, an adequate uh, additional resource to address the um, challenges of uh, educating students in those socioeconomic groups. Andy, you're next. I apologize if this is covered somewhere in the fine print. Um, there's some wide swings on health insurance in this budget, and I think I know what it's about as an employee of the school district, but it might be informative for people to hear. We're not used to seeing double-digit decreases under the cost of health and health insurance. 
but if you look under each school, wherever health appears, there's some wide swings and is there a, a fairly uh, brief explanation for why that's across the board that might inform the town meeting representatives? Sure, um, so we have a new uh, health insurance plan uh, in the state of Vermont for all public schools the, as of December 31st. Um, the Vermont School Boards Insurance Trust that um, essentially facilitated insurance for about 8,000 teachers and 46,000 uh, dependents and other employees, all of those plans were uh, terminated as of December, just a couple of months ago. That was all part of an attempt to uh, comply with the Affordable Care Act. The new plans came out with premiums that are 30% lower than those plans that we had budgeted for in fiscal year 18. Um, the question is, so that's why you see such a dramatic drop in um, premiums. However, uh, there was a collective bargaining agreement that um, had been, has been completed as of um, uh, last May that provided for a uh, health reimbursement arrangement. Uh, the the um, logic behind that was, well, the 30% decline in premiums came with a substantially higher uh, deductible that uh, teachers and all employees were required to pay. So the HRA, the Health Reimbursement Arrangement, came in as an employer benefit to assist with that um, a very high uh, increase in the deductible. On average, we went from about a $1,000 deductible to a $5,000 deductible um, for the, um, the indexed plan. There's four plans, and I'm just talking about the indexed plan. So, so when you look through the budget line items, you'll see, uh, as Andy is pointing out, in some instances, 30% reductions, but then you're seeing a new number in there. It's, it's the health reimbursement arrangement that didn't exist before, um, and that's the employer contribution uh, that assists the employee with those high deductibles. If you took all of that data and you added it up, so you, you added up all of the health care costs and all of the HRAs, you'd see the total goes from um, 1.1 million 683 in the current year, fiscal year 18, so 1 million 683, and the um, proposed is 1 million 608, which is $375,000 less or a, a, a decline of four and a half percent. Unfortunately, subsequent to the budget vote last year that created the funding for us for this fiscal year, the legislature decided to um, retroactively, uh, what they call recapture healthcare costs under the premise that if they had a negotiated a statewide contract, they would have created a certain level of savings. It was a very irregular uh, a, a sequence of events where we set a tax rate, electorate, you know, um, electorate approved budgets. We had a conversation about the cost of education. Everybody went home in um, May, including the legislature, and then, and then in July, they came back and said, whoops, we weren't quite done. Um, we're going to short the check for state aid in this fiscal year. I, I mention all of that just, just in the context that um, it's going to work out fine. We're going to run a surplus this year, um, and it will cover that recapture. Um, and we're, we'll run a surplus in health care because of this, what I'm describing, a 30% decline in, in premiums and the employer not spending more than um, the uh, deductible that is required. Yes. Um, Franz. Okay, go, Franz. Sorry, there's a lot of you in the back too, but Franz is jumping up and down. Um, hi, Franz Reichsman. I'm on the Finance Committee. I live in District 2. 
Um, and I'm talking to the audience here, not asking a question. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that the committee did quite a bit of work on, on our report, and it does make a bold attempt to enable you to understand the school funding formula when you are not in the same room with Frank Rucker. <laughs> so it's a challenge, but it's in there, and I hope, you know, a lot of questions come up. It's, it's complicated, but if you spend a little time with it, I think you'll get a pretty good grasp on um, what the overall situation is, which is that there's a lot financially that the school board does not control. And these numbers arrive from elsewhere. And, you know, then they get massaged, et cetera. But it's all in there, and I hope you find it uh, at least mostly understandable. Um, the other thing, in addition to the funding, of course, is what the schools are doing, and that's the spending side of the budget, and we talk about that too. Um, you know, Andy's question about healthcare expenses is a really good one that we didn't go over in the report in any kind of detail. Um, so I'm glad there's uh, an opportunity for you to hear something about that too. Um, but the real reason I'm standing here is to say, um, after this meeting wraps up, I'm gonna be back there with all the cookies and, uh, and hoping that some of you might wanna come and talk about what the Finance Committee does and how it does it and think about whether you wanna join us for the next year. Uh, the Finance Committee is reappointed at town meeting each year uh, so anybody who thinks they might be interested in participating in our deliberations and uh, creation of our reports, I'll be back there and I'd love to talk to you. So, thank you. Okay, there were a couple of hands in the back. Uh, Dr. Tortolani or Chris, which one of you is coming? <laughs> Hi, my name's Chris Chapman, District 1. I just wanted to say how utterly impressed I am with the work you folks have done, how you've wrestled these numbers. And um, I certainly am coming away from tonight's meeting with a great deal of confidence in the work you've, that you are doing uh, in all these complex matters. And I wanted to say thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bob Tortolani, District 2, a common theme of kind of thank yous. Thank you for having it in a different venue, something that was asked for. I think it's a good idea. Thank you for the nice snacks. Uh, uh, thank you for a very informative uh, annual program that you give. I think I come out of this program feeling a lot, uh, um, somewhat sobered by some of the things that are being dealt with in our society, but also a sense of, uh, of some hopefulness in terms of how you're approaching the, uh, the education of our kids. Uh, probably most importantly, I want to thank all of you educators and administrative educators for all you do to help our kids. I remember as a young fellow, uh, my, uh, one of my very good friends, uh, his dad was a um, math teacher in a fairly large public school in Connecticut, and he was getting very discouraged because his students were not as respectful. I saw that thing that made me think of it respectful to him as they had been when he started his career. And I think about the last 40 years, 50 years in the community here, and the increasing stresses that have been put on our families. Uh, oftentimes they started, as I remember 45, 50 years ago when I started here, it was unusual to have both um, <clears throat> members of the family working and then it became necessary, not always a choice that, that both of them had to work. And, and that put increasing pro, uh, stresses on the family that we saw in health issues. But I am absolutely amazed at what teachers have to do now. They have to teach, they have to look at the nutrition, they have to look at the social aspects, they have to look at the psychological aspects. And they, I would imagine they do a lot of praying at night, uh, thinking about how their kids are gonna make it. So it, it's an amazing situation, and I, what you're going through. And my question is, I there must be an incredible resiliency and hopefulness amongst you to be able to continue to do your work with the stresses that you have. And I, my hat's off to you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? We're a little bit over two hours, so I think maybe we'll call it then. 
If I can have a motion to adjourn from so someone on the board. And all in favor? Aye. We're done. <laughs> Thank you, folks. We'll see you on Saturday. <laughs>